Hey, it's Fan Fantasy here, or you can call me Fan, and this video will be a little different as we're going to be doing an interview with an actual M1A2 gunner in the US Army. He was active duty from September 2019 to February 2024, and he's currently active in the National Guard in his state. And personally knowing him, he's really passionate about tanks and he loves to share that knowledge to others. He's also a fellow Steel Beast player, which you may have heard on my videos. And before we go right in, if you guys enjoy this video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe. There will be more additional parts to this video, so stay tuned for those. And so for this video, I'm going to introduce you all to Bundesfaust as his alias name. With that said, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what do you do? Yeah, hey, uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Um... As of now, I'm a uh, 19 kilo tanker. Um, I joined in 2019 and I, active duty, I joined in uh, 2019. And then I got out of active duty uh, just earlier this year, 2024, um, where I'm just in the National Guard now. Nice. And what made you want to be a tanker instead of uh, an infantry or, you know, something cooler than that? <laughs> uh, I As a kid, I kind of like, I always grew up being in the military and stuff. Um, actually, I grew up watching like dog fights, lock and load with the Arlie Army, uh, greatest tank battles, the the classics. Mm. Um, so that kind of like mindset of like that being an option was you know was always there. Um, I think what really kind of set me on on course to being a tanker was uh, when I got older. I, I played a lot of War Thunder, <laughs> so <laughs> so. Uh, that kind of, you know, piqued my interest in that and everything. Um, originally, when I was talking to different recruiters, um, I was looking at Air Force at first. Oh. Um, but I just decided, I, like, just because I have a bunch of other interests as well, I do music and, and some artwork and stuff. So um, I figured it probably wouldn't... At the time, it didn't seem like the, the logical, um, you know, course of action to, you know, because there's a lot of... It's like a... Was it like eleven year commitment um, to this one thing? Um, and it's not like you can't go do other things, but you know, I, I figured I'd give give myself a little bit of leverage just in case I, you know, I join and I just it's just not for me. Was the eleven um, year the Air Force or? Yeah, oh. I, I'm not sure if it's if that's the actual number, but it's a long time because there's so much money that goes into training. the The idea was wanted to do uh, be a pilot. Mm. Um, so if I did go that route, then it'd be, you know, the actual education side of that and then the actual uh, military ed education of that. Right. And that also takes time and money. And it's just this huge journey, which those who do it, that's like, holy crap, that is impressive. Um, you know, and, and they, they that's their, their career. And then a lot of times, like, you know, it, once they're done with that, they'll go and be airline pilots and stuff. So it's just kind of a life passion. Um, mm. But um i i talked to them uh i kind of i i touched a little bit with uh, some of the marine recruiters um just because i was kind of i did that and i was like oh well i don't know i want to but it's like being a you know an infantryman i figure like well might as well be the the elite infantryman be marines um but i think i don't know i guess i, I just kind of got hooked on tanks and figured i'd go uh go army and do that was that the time when you heard the news about the U.S. Marines were uh, transferring the tanks to to the Army units? I think it was, like, right after is mm. when, um, yeah, it was, like, right after I, I heard something, some rumor about them actually doing that. Uh, and then, lo and behold, it, it was, like, uh, it was actually was right after I got to my first unit. Um, wow. That they actually, like, lost their tanks because it was right after that, um, before we went to... Uh, Korea. We actually got some uh, Marine tankers that came over because they basically told them, uh, at least what I was told by them, they basically told them either get out or reclass or go Army as a tanker. And so a lot of them just, they just liked the job and so they just decided to come to the Army. Oh, that's very interesting to, to hear that transfer. So what was your, your training like to become a 19 kilo? You're talking like, um, like basic training or just like... Ye well, like you're training to to become that. Like uh, I'm assuming everyone has to do basic training, and then they right. they do their, their actual career. Yeah. So um, so on the on 19 kilo trainees go through what's called OSIT, you know, one station unit training. Um, that's basically just think of it like a combination of like 
your basic combat training, which is, you know, you're you know, just sort of yelling at you and you do your basic mm-hmm. you know, soldier skill stuff. And then um, without any break, it goes right into your advanced individual training or AIT. Mm-hmm. And that's where you're actually doing your tank stuff. Um, so when I went through, it was a 15 week cycle, um, mm-hmm. which is divided into five phases, which is red, white, blue, black and gold. Red, white and blue phases is like your uh, is your basic training phases. And then black and gold is your AIT um, portion of your total like OSIT training. Um, now, uh, if I remember correctly on, you can probably find it on the actual army website, but now I'm pretty sure they do 22 week cycles. Um, uh, but it's the same, like divided into five phases, you know, right. sort of makeup. So what exactly did they, uh, teach you guys through, through all those things to become a tanker? Uh, for the most part, it's kind of structured in a, it's like a, I guess you could you could think of it as like a crawl, walk, run type thing. It's just very like fast. Um, hmm. I I I don't I cannot remember the last person I talked to that actually remembered all of their basic training <laughs> experience. You know, in in Osa, it's just so fast, right? Uh, and it's and it's new too. So it's just like you're just learning on the fly, like you know. Um, but um, for the most part, like your red phase is like your basic soldiering. Um, and then white phases like your marksmanship, um, basic rifle, um, basic pistol, and then your uh, uh, your blue phase is like your more intricate like tasks like land navigation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they, they I'm not sure how how often they do it now. They um, they at least used to. I hope they still do it because it's actually pretty cool. But uh, what's called the Nick at Night or NIC Night Infiltration Course, and mm. it's it's the it's the thing you see in some movies where you know they'll go over this. Um, this trench you're in, and the, you know you're low crawling, and you know at night, you know in the mud, and you have you know machine guns firing over your head. It's that you know whole thing. Oh wow, um, okay. Which Live I rounds. thought was really cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, they got tracers and stuff. So <laughs> you know, b- being a military nerd, I, I was like, oh, this is cool. I, you know, I peek up and I see a tracer go over. Like, oh hell yeah, this is <laughs> Just awesome. Just like in the movies. <laughs> oh yeah. But um, yeah. So that, that's pretty much your your red, white, blue phase. Uh, your black and gold phase. Your, so your black phase is like um, where you're starting to get into your um, MOS specific, you mm-hmm. know, which you know is um, in this case 19 kilo. Um, for if you're an infantryman, it'd be 11 Bravo specific yep. stuff. Uh, so really, just your more advanced soldiering and, and infantry stuff, um, as well as uh, I think they I think they touch on Bradleys and Strikers. As well, I could be wrong, okay. um, but more the the in depth stuff there and, and whatever MOS because multiple MOSs have OSIT as their training structure. Mm. Um, but at least in the case of nineteen kilos, um, your black phase is where you're starting to get into your actual uh, motor pool um, operations. So like, r- really just doing you know preventative maintenance. All your like your basic level, your ten level. Um, maintenance on these vehicles how to actually perform maintenance how to drop breach how to punch gun tube how to clean the bore evacuator uh how to take apart the the breach hmm. um how to take the thermal shrouds and everything your bore evacuator off the main gun to actually clean those and make sure those are you know um every part of that serviceable how to do track how to hmm. do hull maintenance how to do tur- everything you know so it's um, getting you to know the tank itself yes. before you actually get into it. Yes. Okay. Um, and then once you're once you're through black phase, your gold phase is where you actually go and do, um, uh, depending on the training schedule, they may actually do the driver's training in black phase. Hmm. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think we did it at the very end of it. It's like the last, like week of black phase, um, but. Either then or in gold phase, you do your driver's training, and then um, you actually do like kind of a mock gunnery. It depends on how they want to actually set it up. When I did it, it really wasn't a gunnery. They just set the, t- the tanks up on online and then had us uh, draw ammo. And it was what was I think it was four rounds. Yeah, it was four rounds. We got to actually uh, load, and then four rounds we actually got to shoot, uh, which was pretty cool actually. Wait, so this um, is live, right? Like. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, if I remember correctly, it was, um, or, or maybe it was two. I can't remember now. 
That's no, okay. it was it was four because it was two Sabo, two Empat, and then we did. Uh, I think it was just uh, one of each at night because we did a day and a night shoot. Um, but it was kind of like give us an idea of you know what it's like to be in the driver's hole when you're shooting, hmm. um, and the loader station and the gunner station, you know, things like that. Because uh, it's not unheard of for someone to get out of basic training, and then you know they they become a PB2, and then they're like, hey, we're short on people. You're a gunner now. You're gonna learn quick. Mm. Um, and and they do, and some of them actually like do really really well, and some of them, you know, not so much, and then you know right. they just sw- switch people out. But it, that's not unheard of. Um, right. I, actually, my first gunner was a was a PFC. Oh. Um, I got I got to the, I got to the unit, and then typically your gunner's supposed to be a sergeant uh, or sometimes a corporal. Oh, okay. Um, but. Um, when I first got to my unit, my first gunner was a PSC, and then I got switched to a a different tank, where my gunner was actually a specialist. So like, it it, it don't matter a sergeant and below, you you could be a gunner. Ah, uh, okay. So in the U.S., there's there is a little bit of a rank structure in terms of who is in what position, but then that's not always the case, right? From what yeah, I'm hearing. Yeah. It, okay. It, needs of the army, really. So it was supposed to be is your um your your privates and specialists are your your drivers and loaders your gunners are sergeants Mm -hmm. um which corporal too but it's supposed to be sergeant Uh, Mm -hmm. usually corporal's gonna make you know five like pretty quick um people usually aren't corporal for very long uh i think in the infantry it's a little bit different but in the tank world it's you're not corporal for very long Okay. Um, yeah. And then your tank commander is either a uh, staff sergeant, a lieutenant, or a sergeant first class. Um, obviously, your lieutenant is going to be your platoon leader, and yep. your sergeant first class is going to be your PSG. Um, yeah. And your wing tanks are going to be your staff sergeant. But that's how it's supposed to be. But Needs of the Army says, hey, we don't have a gunner in this tank. This tank needs a gunner. It, you know, to shoot. Um, a PFC. Freaking, I don't know, some derogatory term. Hey, get in the gunner's hole. <laughs> we're you're gonna, we're gonna learn today. <laughs> yeah, no, li- literally, it's it's like that. Uh, actually, that's kind of what happened to me. Um, uh, basically, to leave it a little vague, I'm, I'm like, obviously I'm not gonna throw names out there, but uh, I had a gunner at one point that was uh, subpar, <laughs> to put it lightly, hmm. um, and. Uh, they basically said they they took me aside and they said like, hey, are you ready to take this seat? Because we're about to boot this dude. And mm. you know, I wasn't gonna you know check it out and be like, oh no, it's it's scary, it's new, I don't know. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And then immediately after, I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> 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 you know. But no, it wasn't bad. I, I, had, I had a good tank commander. Um, I actually that like it was right after that when I became a gunner. That was when like. I had my tank commander at the time was awesome. Mm. He, he, he still is. He's, he's actually a recruiter now. Nice. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's riveting. But you you know you learn quick. Um, I, I had really good leadership pretty much all the way through. Um, That's good. And what position is your favorite position out of all? Oof, that's that's tough. I I would say it's 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 between loading and gunning, because I I love slinging rounds. That that yeah, that gets me hyped. I um, heard a lot of people like loader too. And oh it's yeah, an underrated no, it's a, role. It's it is underrated. You get the you get the sling rounds. You get to watch the breach. You get to see everything happen in the turret and hear it, and you get to shoot a machine gun. Like, dude, mm. it's awesome. Um. But probably gunner. I I, I think hmm. um, not just because you know you get to use you know the main gun and actually shoot it and everything, uh, but I think just the responsibility that comes with it and being you know that being in that leadership position. I like teaching people stuff, so um, you know being able to just be there and, and help dudes out because you're responsible for like two dudes. So yeah, you know having two guys that you can mentor and take care of, um, ensure their you know their needs are met. That way they can you know fulfill their role in the tank and accomplish yeah. the you know the overall mission 
um, I think I take a lot of pride in that. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And from my understanding, loaders are also kind of the second in command in the tank too, right? If, if the oh yeah, yeah. Commanders the, look, by- the loader will absolutely be. Uh, I I I like to call the loader like the second tank commander because as soon as that TC is on the net, the loader's taken over it, like, automatically. Yeah. That that tank's got to keep moving and stay in the fight. Um, I, I it was uh, um, it was the last loader I had. I told him like, hey, learn like, you know. Like start practicing. We gotta start practicing. Like you know, you working me on the targets and like giving me fire commands and stuff, because like you're the only person that you know out there that can see stuff. You know, if the yeah. if the TC is busy, TC might be working BMS. You know, using that system or on the net. Um, you know, communicating. It, especially if it, if it's the PL, uh, sometimes the PSG or or the XO or commander. Like, absolutely, the loader has to be able to move that tank. Yeah. So maybe you could tell us about the average day as a tanker. Uh, what did you do? What kind of training routines uh, do you do every day? You know, because it is like a job, right? So just yeah, maybe you can go through. How is that like? So pre- pretty much the, the basic outline of, and this is just from my experience. You know, other people are gonna have uh-huh. a little bit you know different experiences, but for the most part, it's um, pretty much you know zero six thirty first formation for accountability. Um, and then you, you roll in the PT from there. Mm. Um, and then about seven thirty zero eight you, that's when you break, go to, go do hygiene, uh, get, you know, get into your, your work uniform, um, get your breakfast real quick. And then, mm. um, at zero nine, you're pretty much, you're down on the motor pool. Like if, if you don't have tanks, God bless you are living the life because, <laughs> because other than that you're, you were in the motor pool working on that working on that thing um uh typically on 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 mondays you'll have like a you know a big formation um mm-hmm. you know for like kind of a uh weekly accountability uh sergeant major will be down there your battalion commander um so you'll have a b- battalion formation in the motor pool mm. um and then they'll you know to all the first sergeants, like, hey, you know, go conduct command maintenance, and then they salute them, and then they, you know, everyone disperses. Uh, so, so, so I, either, the, either hmm? it's like a drill and ceremonial kind of thing, right? Almost, is it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it, okay. I mean, everyone everyone forms up by company, um, yeah. and then sergeant major comes out, and then usually he'll kind of put out a couple of things, like, you know, hey, thanks for the, you know, quiet weekend, and blah blah blah, um, and he'll he'll do his speech, and then you know. He'll say, you know, first, first aren't go conduct command maintenance, and they'll say, Roger, and then, <laughs> and then y'all and then dismiss. Everyone, you know, yep, yeah, pretty yeah. much. They'll they'll about face and dismiss everyone. And go work on mm. their tanks. Um. Then uh, after that, you know, you'll do you'll be doing your maintenance. Um, you know, whatever needs to be done in the morning, and then you'll, uh, if you're if they're your tank is in a total catastrophe. You'll be able to break for lunch at eleven thirty. Mm. Uh, <laughs> some, ta- some tanks just they they just aren't having it. They just break. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's like uh, it's like a living being right. almost. Like yep. have, each tank has its own personality. Some of them just I don't know. They just have a mind of their own sometimes. Yeah, I, um, I've asked. Um... A real armor guy and his leopard. Uh, so let me ask you this: How often do do Abrams break? Often? Uh, I'd say probably as much as as any tank. I mean, mm. they're they're heavy, so they like just sitting there, like they just kind of break themselves. <laughs> um, it it's weird. It's yeah. Um, I wouldn't say to a point where it's like just this. You know, I, I I'm sure people are gonna misconstrue that as like, oh, they're just inoperable. No, they're operable. Mm-hmm. Things don't fight. They're just not fully mission capable so mm. meaning you know track maintenance needs to be done the pack needs to be pulled to clean to clean the engine bay and then do services on the pack you know all these little it's a lot of little stuff and those right. little things add up to bigger you know issues so it's you know it may be fully mission capable but uh when your your wing nuts for your front right periscope it like the washer is missing for some reason and so it can't like get a good like you know Really, you can't really cinch it down, so it just kind of vibrates a little bit. So it's this little things you have to deal with, mm-hmm. and it accumulates into this big, like, 
wow, everyone's stations is just kind of mediocre. Like you can run it, but it's like, why, 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 why is this not fixed? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, th- think of it like, uh, like if you have a car and you just go years and years and years without getting like, like an alignment or changing your tires, yep. you can, you can drive it. Is it optimal? No. <laughs> right. It's <laughs> always can, trying can to totally tune it. fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Is there um, a different MOS that deals with the maintenance, or do you also have to be responsible for that tank? So they have two different... Uh, generally, they have two different levels of maintenance. Um, you have your operator in maintenance, which is your 10-level tasks, and then yeah. your maintainer level, your mechanic you know, maintenance, which is your 20-level. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually see, like... If you ever find a picture of, like, the front cover of one of the TMs, the last thing you'll see is 10 dash and then a number which is the volume so in, in case of in the case of the abrams the dash four which is the fourth volume there it would be 10 dash four and then before that is just a long string of number that just identifies what vehicle it's mm-hmm. for um okay and then for the mechanics it'd be 20 dash and then I, I don't remember how many volumes they have they probably have like 900 or something mm-hmm. um but it, th- their maintenance is like deep like they pull out wiring harnesses and all sorts of crazy stuff um all all we do is preventative maintenance uh things clean the gun to do aacs your Mm -hmm. armament armament accuracy armament accuracy checks there um you know all all those different things right um that is like has it pretty much has like an immediate effect the maintainers do you know long-term stuff Mm -hmm, Uh, mm -hmm. that makes that's one way you can think of it so how often do you guys take out take your tanks out um, per week or or on an average day? Do you guys usually roll with your tanks or do trainings with them or how's that like? Uh, we we try to as much as possible. Um, usually, like I would say, probably depending on the unit, every couple months. Mm-hmm. Um, the the unfortunate reality is training is very expensive. Uh, so things yeah. like fuel parts. Um, and then, and then also, you're not only dealing with, you know, funding the training, but you're also dealing with scheduling the training. And this is stuff that has to be scheduled, like, way in advance, like, a year in advance or something. Okay. Um, uh, which is great, but then it comes down to actually doing it. And then, oh, actually, we don't have quite the funding for this. So now we have to downgrade the training so instead of oh we're actually doing a gunnery now we're using miles or you know some other you know like substitute for this thing Mm. so we try and make it work um but most for the most part like we actually it it you know goes through and we actually okay we actually plan to do a gunnery okay we're actually doing a gunnery now yeah Um, but there's some situations where it's you know um there was uh one exercise that we did in Korea, and I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be live fire. It was supposed to be like a platoon. Uh, it was supposed to be like a, a Calfex, hmm. um, but you know, combined arms uh, live fire exercise. Um, and I think it, uh, I think just because of funding, it, it was either because of funding or I think there was actually, I think there was actually uh, protesters <laughs> in, oh. in, in South Korea that were like angry because uh, about us shooting like main gun and stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, and so um, we just. For one of those, one reason or another, we just ended up not doing, you know, live rounds. Um, but we also didn't. Um, oh no! Yes, we did. We did have miles. Yeah, we used we used miles as a substitute, and then. Um, what's uh? What's miles, by the way? Miles is the uh, multiple integrated multiple integrated laser engagement system. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Yep. But yeah, yeah, they 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 have they have that system for like everything for hmm. troops, all like every vehicle we have. Um, because there's like a port. Um, there's some ports that you plug the actual system into, and it communicates with the vehicle. Because the vehicle has like the software to actually, you know, communicate between the two. Um, but we we ended up using that, which it did it. It we accomplished the, the at least like the communi- the you know shoot move communicate portion of it. We just you know couldn't actually shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we did it with the the emphasis on acting like we're actually firing real rounds and making the, the same kind of, um, you know, decisions and everything. Mm. Um, just so at least, you know, you get like, you know, 
you know, decent trading value out of it. Yes. You know, even, though, even though we can't shoot really real rounds. Yeah, for the most part, it, it, typically we'll do like two uh, crew gunneries uh, a year, and then uh, we'll do other uh, things like uh, Califex. I, I think just this year alone, there's been um, the last unit I was with. They they did it was like right after I left. They did a crew gunnery, and then uh, platoon sticks. What else? Then they did Califex, and then not too long ago they did. Um, they just actually just got back from NTC, like it's like like a month ago or something. Mm. Um, but like they like it's pretty it's pretty busy. Um, I would say it's more or less like evenly spaced out throughout the year. It'll, it'll be a lot of different things, um, and you'll also have like different like uh, you know competition stuff, which will usually be like not necessarily with the tanks, but it'll be like um, you know. Doing like a, a big ruck march event or whatever, like the Norwegian foot march or something like that. Mm -hmm. So how often uh, do you guys go to NTC? I know that uh, seems like a lot of units rotate <coughs> in and out there to do their trainings. Uh, at least, at least with, um, with my last unit, uh, they have done. So when I actually when I first got there, they just got back from NTC. And that was in, uh, actually that was 2020. Um, and then, yeah, so about, I, I, about every four years, I would say. Hmm. Um, and usually those, those kind of CTC rotations, um, like, so you have those as part of your, your key training objectives to qualify a certain unit for a deployment right. or a rotation things like that um <clears throat> so like um actually really good really good example um last gunnery i shot as a loader um it was i think we just completed table five which is like the practice you know live fire mm -hmm. um before the table six which is your actual qualification um and it was it was yeah it was right before table six and our battalion commander came out, and uh, because of a, a certain developing situation in the uh, in another continent, mm -hmm. um, uh, they basically said like, "Hey, once we're done here, you know, like we're gonna be, this gunnery qualifies us for IRF, which is immediate response force, um, mm. and we're going to Germany." Um, and so we're like, "Oh shoot, this is like." potentially real as shit so um you know we shot that gunnery and then it was like um gosh it was like it was only a couple of days we, we got back we did all our after operations maintenance and then it was like right after that uh they're like hey here's the packing list pack your stuff be ready because this is like this is about to go down Hmm. Um, and then, and then I did, and then we, we, uh, like pretty much no notice, threw our bags on a, on a truck, went to the airport and got bus to the, uh, to the airport, flew out to Germany. And then, uh, it was like less than a week. We actually got there, uh, occupied barracks, drew our, uh, they had pre positioned tanks and everything and brads and everything, yeah. um, there. Uh, so we occupied Barris, went down, signed for equipment, got accountability for all the stuff. Um, and then, uh, it was like less than a week. We actually got, uh, we already started crew gunnery and got main gun rounds that range. So theoretically, wow. we could, those could have been service rounds. Yeah. Um, which is, I think is cool being a part of, it sucked in the, in, you know, at the time, but. Yes. Yes. Um. So basically like NTC, going back to that, uh. They they certify your unit if you're ready to be deployed. Yeah, it's 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 part of those key training objectives. Okay. Um, I'm not I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the totality or like what the um what all boxes need to be checked basically. Uh, right. But I know like NTC crew gunnery like platoon live fire those are some of the things that will um those are some of those boxes that can yeah, be yeah. checked to, you know, qualify a unit. Uh, I'm sure it changes depending on, you know, what kind of, you know, where they're going or, um, you know, what unit yeah. it is, things like that. 
so it's I'm so sure. sounds like it's it goes from the tank crew all the way up to basically your your commanding officer and how well you guys do right so it's all culminating of these things for ntc it goes all the way up to the brigade yeah okay wow yeah so so it is um like the when you do ntc is is your like whole brigade out there hmm. which is neat but the the only ones that i've done uh like ctc wise are uh jmrc which that was a brigade mission hmm. um at, at hohenfels uh germany and then uh jrtc which that was that was a that was a brigade mission but we were a um an armor package at- attached to the 82nd uh oh, airborne so okay. it was it really it was just like trying to i think from our quickly uh i think it was actually the the first time like m1s have been used at jrtc as well oh wow at least the set b3s yeah. i know for a fact it was a set b3s if it's if not m1s in general um but it was basically just to kind of uh integrate us and see like how how that combination of elements is able to operate in a such a restrictive area because uh jmr jrtc is super restrictive like there's just rat trails everywhere like if you look at footage from there it's all like trucks cars and like 113s uh, oh you know. okay like it is, it is, it's really tiny. Um, which, which was nice. Cause my driver was flying down those rat trails. <laughs> I, like, like it was like, they were like, not even like, cause it was like grass and stuff. The grass was like smacking the, the fenders of the tank. The tank was wider than like, you know, the like invisible trail. <laughs> wow. So yeah, no, it's restrictive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the only open area is like by the airfields. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, we did that to, uh, kind of experiment with, with that and see how that actually would work out and figure out some actual uh like you know hard training points for you know the 82nd to work on because they're going to uh the m10 right they actually they actually dropped out they didn't have an m10 or an mpf but they had a uh a bradley they loaded up at um uh hunter armor airfield uh in georgia Mm -hmm. and they flew it all the way out to uh, Louisiana at GRTC, and they landed on that airfield and dropped it off, and then took right off as soon as as soon as it was uh, unloaded. Pretty mm-hmm. much to to simulate, you know, because the Brad's close enough to the M10's weight, okay, uh, to kind of simulate, you know, like, okay, how quickly can we actually like, the no point joke, them. yeah, wow. yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, it's like they can't exactly be airdropped, but they can land, unload and get out of there you know pretty quickly um right. but uh it was kind of a, a test of those those two things and then also working with tanks and stuff um it was it was a test for us too because it's you know like i said it's super restrictive terrain so um, yeah not smacking your your gun tube on a tree was um easier said than done um i have no idea how i did not do that i i, I think there was i think there was one time i, I nearly did because we were going on the down a trail and i didn't see like how the road bended or anything oh uh, and i think i just happened to, to bring the gun back to the front and i just see in my face this tree go like right by i'm like oof that was oof wouldn't your that commander be there. telling you to traverse your gun in, at a certain direction at, if you're in the forest it listen it, it is hard to tell <laughs> typically typically yes but it is hard to tell like where the end of the gun tube is versus like a tree especially yeah. if especially when you're on the net and you're talking to because because i was the uh the exos gunner at the time yeah so the exo was talking to the commander talking to uh you know the other platoons as he's also trying to keep track of where we're going and it's it's too easy to to, to you know for that to slip um and my the loader i had then he was actually uh, an infantry guy um so he wasn't exactly up to speed <laughs> right right can't, <laughs> can't expect it, 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 <laughs> he just didn't he just didn't have the 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 experience to be able to just tell you know yeah. um it was like right after it happened he was like "Ooh," and i was like yeah jesus <laughs> um thankfully i didn't hit anything that's good uh, yeah so. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that would be a, a story for people to tell you about <laughs> 
how do you guys do combined arms trainings? Is it is it an easy training exercise to do? Because there's a lot of coordination between the infantry and you know other elements with you guys. So just wondering how how there, is that like? There is a there is a crap ton of planning, and there is um there's one key point, and this this really transfers over to anything that is very like time sensitive or like you know coordination sensitive. Hmm. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse every mm -hmm. single time if like even if it's just verbally in fact that's one of the things we do is we do a, a um you know a rehearsal over of like a mission or or you know whatever over the radios and actually talk through what we're doing you know with, with you know whatever notes we have uh you know and part of it is you know off script just because you know like you have to just know yeah um but that is absolutely critical and actually conducting these kind of training operations um which is good because that's exactly the same thing that's going to have to go into conducting a real you know force on force you know um mission right you know, against an actual adversary so um but um yes there, there's a lot of coordination a lot of planning um there is i i could not like there's no way i could think of every like level of planning <laughs> you know uh but there's certain things like like how much ammo are you ordering are you ordering who's managing the the mm. ammo um what officer who's the oic for this who's the the person in charge of the range that you're using uh who's in charge of each platoon and what are their responsibilities who's in charge of each kind like it just goes up you know all, at all echelon Mm. Uh, all levels of uh, um, echelon. Um, everyone has so many. And it's not just like, oh, the PL, you know, has the, you know, first platoon platoon leader is just that platoon leader. He also has these other adjacent responsibilities that he has to worry about. Yeah. Um, you know, and everyone has that. So there is absolutely a lot of, um, you know, training or coordination and communication. Uh, when that happens so that's why it's you know super critical to actually rehearse um but um yeah when it actually is executed it actually it typically goes like actually really smoothly um i i can't can't really think of like any real there's never really been like a you know a gunnery or a um you know like combined arms exercise that I've you know been in where it was just like this big just like oh brother in a moment like mm. you know, who dropped the ball this time you know it's it's um if any if anything if uh w you know if something goes wrong or or you know something is happening late or it's too early um it the training is going it's mm -hmm. it's not oh oh pause everyone reset let's you know let's run it again no you're you're in it like especially if it's mm. live fire you're in it so you are you know charlie might continue mission um yep. figure it out like and and that's that's i think what um is really good about ctc rotations using models and stuff because cause you do these elaborate plans and then you get to watch it just shatter into a million pieces and now you get to see um you're you know, especially if you're like a company commander or you know or higher you get to see those under you pick out those pieces and try and assimilate a, you know a new course of action mm -hmm. and then you are you know you get you have to get to see it fall apart again and then you get to pull a ton of training value out of that and lessons learned and things to implement into further exercises yeah or you get to see them actually successfully you know pull it together reorganize and actually execute you know um that mission, you know, successfully, despite the just, you know, chaos that just happens, you know, right. you have the same, no, no, uh, no plan, um, survives first contact. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's, that's, you know, it, anytime it, at, at no point is there a flawless, you know, execution of anything. It's yep. the, um, the ability to actually, you know, adapt and overcome, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yes. Um, but. But yeah, no, uh, I, I've never really been a part of anything that was, you know, that was rough. It's always either been figured out or um, it just, you know, went smooth because it was a simple thing like gunnery, you know. Yeah. 
and I can imagine it in the real world too. Um, either your your platoon or your company's behind or something like that, and so you still gotta execute, right? Um, yes. Yeah. So Absolutely. I can see that in the real world, and also in our in our still be session too. I remember, you know, we had to fly, find a an, uh, an exploit, you know, over the enemy, and so that kind of threw us off. Yep. And absolutely, the 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 enemy is a dynamic and uh, thinking entity, and yeah. uh, we'll find every way to <laughs> to make your your plans just simply not work. Yeah, and and I guess for you as as um, uh, an NCO, you're just a small a small fish in in the big ocean of of warfare, and so. I guess like you may not fully see the big picture or what or what's happening in the big picture things. I assume not always. Um, one one of the nice things about being on, um, um, like if you're on a, on a platoon sergeant's track or your PL's track or you know, in my case, I was on our XO's track. One of hmm. the nice things is um, you kind of like you can. It's not hard to just ask like, "Hey, sir, let me see your map. Can you explain to me like what's going on?" And that if if you are in that situation, really. The, Regardless of who your tank commander is, you should be asking that. You should mm. know exactly, you know, what your disposition is, what's going on, um, where are we going. Uh, you know, study your map because that map is going to give you some insight into. Okay, we're going here. We're coming from this direction. So when I'm scanning this area about this time when we're supposed to be at this checkpoint, I know that there's going to be, you know, this terrain feature that I have to worry about. Because that goes into, you know, like setting up, you know, establishing TRPs, establishing um, things like that. So that way you're not figuring that out, you know, in the moment. You know, if something just be where it looked like it was on the map, you just adjust rather than just, you know, make something up. You know? Yeah. Um, but that is the nice thing about being like, um, you know, being a CO's gunner or an XO's gunner is like you really can, uh, you know, you can just look at the graphics on the actual BMS and, you know, ask questions like, hey, what's you know why are we doing this but you know and you start learning a lot about how you know a company functions i'm no expert but um having a little bit of that insight you kind of um it's good because you can take that back down to the platoons when you become a tank commander um mm -hmm. or if, you know whatever route you know you take or wherever you you end up going that's more stuff that you can take and actually uh implement into how you do things that will better support the actual company mission or you know whatever echelon that is i guess another uh moving on to a different topic um or a fun topic is uh i guess uh what is your favorite memory or story as as a tanker Ooh, that's that's a tough one that's a tough one there, there's there's a lot of stuff i think <laughs> i think uh i think Probably my favorite story would have to be uh, the time at um, uh, GRTC. Yeah, my I, I think probably my favorite story, and this is just like <laughs> it's like this is like a, the doomsday event of my uh, <laughs> of my time on tanks. I've never had something this bad happen before. So we were we were uh, we were in a wood line, and we were um, I forget I forget what we were doing. We 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 I think we we're just there just to. Oh, you know what? We're trying to communicate with our medics and uh, um, position them where uh, where the CO needed. Because um, our XO was, um, my, you know, my TC was talking to them and saying like, "Hey, be over here. You're gonna be doing this." Blah blah blah. And uh, and we were. He came back and we, were, you know, you know, fired her up, starting to move out. And and my loader, who's you know an infantry guy, he's telling um, you know, which he had the right you know intention. He didn't. Mm. The actual execution wasn't exactly uh, too good. Mm. Uh, he he tried to you know, you know, help direct my driver. You know, like a loader should. Yeah. Um, by you know saying like, hey, you know, start bringing it left. And uh, one thing, if you don't know, once you hear your your track start slipping on the sprocket, you hear this knocking noise. Oh. You know, you'll you'll hear kung 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 kung, and when you hear that, you know, if you're a driver you just you know straight and keep going don't stop just mm. you know go and it'll kind of walk it, it, itself back on mm. well that start happening and i don't think my loader did not know what that was it like he just didn't identify that as like what that was yeah 
just you know not being a, an experienced tanker. Yeah. And so my driver straightens out, and my loader yells at my driver, and I uh, I asked my driver like why he did this because he knows. And he's like, oh, I thought we were gonna like run someone over or something. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, because he, he brought it back left and then our, our track slipped out the sprocket like it was like if you imagine like uh like how the track pads look you have like kind of like the two halves and then mm-hmm. in between is the center guide um, yeah. like the tooth of it okay the yeah. the track was like a quarter way just off and just kind of like at this canted like angle on oh, there okay. um I, so, I I got <laughs> I got a video and pictures of this too if you <laughs> if you want to sure. throw this in there sure but um. Yeah, it was off, and we just kind of stopped because we tried, you know, going straight, and it was not working. So, like, okay, what is actually going on? So we got we got out, opened the skirts up, and looked, and uh, we tried opening the number one skirt, which is that frontmost one with that, you know, that composite screen in there, and uh, we could not get it open because that pin was that hold that uh you know retains it, that co- keeps it closed, mm. was being bent <laughs> on, <laughs> on the the actual pinhole. And oh, no. I, I kid you not, that number one skirt was flexing, like it was like not very much, but it was enough. And it was, and I was, I'm looking at this like, if this thing somehow cracks open, this we're gonna be like, because <laughs> because I knew the whole like, uh, there's a whole procedure like if, if any of the armor is exposed or anything like the you know the scary secret stuff. Mm-hmm. Um. And uh, I'm looking at this like, if this thing breaks open, we're stuck here, and we got to cover this up, and then we got to get like S2s, got to do a million things. So oh no! <laughs> I, I am just beyond pissed, just like stressed it out, <laughs> and everyone else is like, what, "What's the big deal? What? <laughs> like, dude, <laughs> ah, um, oh. yeah." And from there, I think it w- it was like like three of us tried fixing it, and we just I think. Honestly, collectively, we just kind of made it worse, and um, we ended up having to just oh man, what what all we even do? We we had to sit there with an impact gun. We we have these um, it's called a track jack. It's just okay. these uh, two claws, and you're supposed to use them to um to pull the two ends of the track together so you can put the end connectors on. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, connect you know one end of the track to the other. Uh, we're sitting th- sitting there, and there's so much tension on the track. Um, that we we ended up having to put the track jacks on and pull it together a little bit, and then get the uh, it's like a giant um pry bar. We call it a tanker bar because uh, we have to be everything has to be a tanker or something. <laughs> but we ended up using that as a you know like a giant chisel to with a sledgehammer to beat the the center guide and the end connectors off. And <laughs> we get those off, and then we're <laughs> we're just looking at these these track jacks holding. The track, which is still under tension, mm. um, just because just because of the way it's lodged there, and we're looking at this like this is a freaking grenade. This is gonna explode. Actually, oh, no. one of the end connectors did explode. We we tried moving the track, and we just hear this uh, this like ping noise, and oh. we see this puff of dust towards this, where the sprocket is. Yeah, and this it's like it was like half an end connector. It's like a split second. There's a dirt road like. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It was like maybe like a hundred meters from us. It was like a split second after we see this dust kick up, and like that would have destroyed someone. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> like, like, oh yeah, it was. I don't, even, I don't even know. It was bad. That's that was my that's my favorite story. I think my favorite memory. It's hard to narrow it down, but I think it has to be just my time with my last crew. Um, mm. I, I don't think I've had more fun as a tanker than with them. That was that was like the greatest time. Uh, that that was the crew we shot top tank together and everything. Um, in the in the battalion. Wow. Um, so you guys were top tank. Yeah. Just in wow. The battalion. That's a nice uh, flex right there. You know. Oh yeah. 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 yeah, we, yeah. We, all, we all got a got a hat that says uh, that says it too with the battalion <laughs> uh, insignia on there. Nice. <laughs> I got it right next to me too. I think if anything else. I'm just really thankful to all, you know, all my past leadership. Um, I do not believe I would be who I am today um, mm. without, you know, all my past gunners, tank commanders, platoon sergeants. Mm. Um, I absolutely owe, owe them 100%. Uh, so if you all are watching this, thank you. So what would you say to those who are very skeptical about tanks in the modern age, especially with 
all the tools that can easily knock out tank like a drone or something or or even a missile system oof oh that's a tough question there's never really going to be like a real one size fits all you know weapon system that knock out tanks mm. um or you know just avs in general honestly um just because it's it's a constant dilemma where you can't really be all that proactive about it like most of the just throughout history, especially with armored vehicles, a lot of the solutions and uh, to both, you know, protecting against those types of weapons and developing weapons to uh, be better at, you know, taking out vehicles. It's, you know, a constant um, you know, dilemma between those two things. Um, I mean, for example, like World War II, you had like man portable anti-tank weapon systems like the Panzerfaust, yeah. M1 and M9 Bazooka. Uh, a bunch of others, which I mean, those two I think kind of revolutionized those types of weapon systems. But um, with that, of course, every country is going to have their own their ways, depending on you know what theater they're in, what you know their uh, doctrinal implementation of those vehicles are. Yeah, uh, you know, like with I mean, even World War II, you saw cages, uh, side skirts. I mean, we, we used sandbags for. <laughs> Yeah, even for wood. Protection. Yeah, yeah, logs and stuff. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to, like, you know, GWAT. Um, you know, you had M1s, you know, taking fire from, like, you know, heavier RPG warheads, super massive IEDs, yep. uh, stacked AT mines, EFPs, all sorts of crazy stuff, um, which, you know, influenced the development of Tusk and Busk for both the, you know, um, the M1, mm. A1s, A2s, and the Bradleys. Um as well as, you know, other, like, IED and um, crew survivability enhancements as well. Hmm. Um, and now, today, we have the, you know, prolificity of, of drones being a common tool, not only, you know, as an observation tool, but as a uh, very, very effective anti-tank weapon uh, yep. platform. Um, I guess that the main thing, which is, I think is kind of funny about the question, though, is... Um, just and this is just you know from what I've seen, it seems like to me um, that people tend to be kind of fixated on you know like the big question is like like is the tank obsolete or whatever yeah um, or this tank versus that or this weapon versus you know tank you know um, you don't really hear anything like some game changer anti artillery weapon or anti you know whatever uh, other thing it's it's from what I've seen, the big thing is like, oh, you know, this country just lost, you know, a, a million tanks in this event or something due to something. Um, and at least to me, I think the fixation on which tank is better or, you know, what, whatever the subject matter is, it's usually tanks, um, is indicative that they will continue to be critical assets mm -hmm. uh, that will be, you know, a devastating and shocking force on the modern battlefield. Um, even as it, you know, inevitably evolves. Um, and at least as far as, you know, as far as my, uh, how should I put it? My circle of, of, uh, coworkers, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, you know, my, my fellow soldiers, um, uh, they will, they will be manned by proficient and aggressive crews that, you know, using tactics that reflect the tempo and intensity of maneuver warfare. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't see, you know, I don't see there being an end to that kind of uh, dilemma. But um, at the same time, um, soldiers mm -hmm. and, and crews will will continue to adapt. And yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, like, especially with um, technology, right? Like, sure, it will knock out a tank easily, but. The opposite is also true where they'll find a, uh, like a, a counter to that right so like mm -hmm. maybe it's electronic warfare stuff or yep yeah, exactly yeah so there's always going to be that you know it's almost like this arms race between you know weapon system and protective system you know um but that's you know that's just the that's just the nature of things uh also not every conflict's going to be the same mm -hmm. um you know, not it's it, not every conflict is going to be you know tanks dominating the battlefield. 
um, or this, you know, being the ultimate weapon or that or whatever. Yeah. It's it's really gonna be. Uh, I mean, you can really throw the Met TC answer. You know, you, you know, what's your mission? What kind of enemy are you fighting? What uh, what do you have? <clears throat> what do you have? Uh, on the battlefield, you know, what what kind of time or terrain or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that whole thing, like, it's it really is just mission dependent and, you know, who has what yeah. and how are they implementing it. So, um, but that's, that's you know, that's why we, you know, in the military, we, we talk about it so much is because, um, you know, while it's hard to stay proactive, it's better to, you know, think of ways, um, the enemy might use, you know, a certain technology or whatever yeah. against us, or how we can better, you know, use what we have, uh, you know, in our you know, to our advantage. So it, it's a it's a complicated discussion. <laughs> for sure. And that's it for part one of our interview with Bundesfaust. Part two, we'll be talking about video games and simulations and all that fun stuff. Make sure to check out his YouTube channel and hit that like if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you on my next video.